Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this week you have heard a lot about the open science and everything that uh, we understand under this uh, term, but uh, probably not much about the open access to the research infrastructure as such. We talk a lot about the open access to the data, to the publications, things like that, but, but we forget that to create this data, you need the equipment. And open access to the research equipment is one of the fundamental ingredients of the open science. So today I will talk to you how we approach this subject at our university. This was caused by quite large investments in the past couple of years, since we have run two large investment projects, one into acquiring the supercomputing capabilities for Republic of Slovenia, which you will see later this afternoon uh, when visiting the, uh, in combined power, the fourth most powerful computer in the world at the uh, Institute of um, Computing Sciences which is Computer Vega, and that investment was in the amount of 20 million euro, plus we acquired additional 6 million euro from the Euro HPC joint undertaking, and this computer in Maribor that you will see later was actually first European computer put into the operation last year through the Euro HPC joint undertaking. So we are very happy. You know, for that, I had the privilege to run this project and also the second one. So uh, this was really a fit to get all together computer running during the COVID crisis. So we had uh, good partners, you know, throughout this project and uh, almost impossible things were necessary to make the computer, to build the computer, to certify the computer, which is now, of course, used by the researchers not only in Slovenia, but worldwide and primarily for the European research community. The second project was connected to acquiring state-of-the-art research equipment for the University of Maribor. Uh, a little bit shy of 30 million euro was the project and about 27 million euro was used to acquire state-of-the-art equipment, which means top-grade microscopes, nano-CT scanners, analytical devices, whatever you can imagine, you know, we have um, acquired through this project, which is a project still in running because uh, in acquiring that much equipment, you know, and uh, facing the consequences of COVID, there were necessary delays. So now this project was extended to March in 2023, when we will complete this investment project. Of course, when uh, acquiring that much of equipment, we wanted to make good use of it. Now, probably, if you all come from the academia, you understand how difficult sometimes it is to get to the equipment that somebody else operates, even at your faculty, even at your university, even at the other university. Usually, you do not have enough information where the equipment is available, you know, what is capable of, and even less information how to access this equipment. Of course, we approached this problem to try to solve these issues and made all this equipment available to researchers in public sector, also in private sector, through the open access. The European Union actually provided a European charter for access to research infrastructures in 2016, which is kind of a blueprint how we would like to do this in Europe. Joint research centers in Europe long time operate under these headings, but for the universities, this is something new. And when we negotiated these projects with the Ministry for Education and Science in our country, we promised them that, that we will be like a pioneering university, introducing open access to research infrastructure at our university, which then could be copied by other universities in Slovenia and hopefully we make it good or elsewhere in Europe. In some countries there are some, I would say, um, um, ingredients of this already present, especially in certain specialized communities which share data, but not on a general level. 
not on a country or not, not even on a European level. Because I, as a researcher, would like to know where the necessary equipment for my research is available, not only in Europe, but across the world. And this is our vision, you know, that with these steps we can approach this uh, dream, you know, to uh, share our equipment, to make better use of it, you know, and of course to implement the open science also in that way. So in the next couple of minutes I will be talking about the necessary constituents to implement such an open access to the research infrastructure, which are listed here. So first of all, we will stop at definition, what is the public research infrastructure? So this is not just the equipment, this is not just the core, let's say, research infrastructure, not just buildings, but these are also people, researchers, procedures that are set up to generate knowledge. We should never forget. So research, public research infrastructure is, of course, pe people, and the equipment and the buildings. All these necessary combines or constitute the research infrastructures. So organized public research infrastructure is of course a prerequisite for a good research work that can benefit mankind and of course countries that invest into this equipment. In terms of core research equipment, this equipment can be physical so a microscope, nano CT scanner, analytical device, and can also be virtual. That means all software systems that are installed on computers that you can usually access virtually or remotely. So all this is the infrastructure. And the public research infrastructures are usually managed by the universities and the institutes like, like we know. It is important to understand that research infrastructure is always placed into the entities. So entity is any kind of organization at the lowest hierarchical level that basically operates an equipment. So a microscope is placed into the research group, which has a, obviously a leader, uh, members, you know, but this research group is an entity that operates such a, such a microscope like a supercomputer that you will see today, is positioned in an institute, which is an entity that operates this supercomputer. So entities can be of different sizes. There will be a couple of people, there can be a several hundreds of people, depending on the infrastructure. Now the users, of course, would like to use this equipment, and this equipment should be openly available if the public money was used to purchase the equipment and if public money is used to operate the equipment. Then the equipment should be freely available for open access to any researcher that works on a public research project. And if government pays for everything, this should be for free. If the government does not pay for, let's say, current operation costs, of course, then we can charge some fees which should have the fundamental basis to use this equipment. Of course, the users always participate in creating new knowledge because if you have a researcher that visits you, uses your equipment, you know, with or without your help, then of course you make a personal contact, you share the ideas, and usually this leads to a higher level cooperation. So open access to research infrastructure is very important also to initiate new research in new areas. And with sharing the data, you know, across disciplines, with that we contribute to this thirst for knowledge, you know, people get interested, well, Perhaps I can do something with this equipment for my case, you know, not just to be divided, you know, typically like chemists have their own equipment, mechanical engineers have their own equipment, you know, social sciences have their own equipment, you know, and then very seldomly they exchange ideas, they get together into common research. Now, sharing more information, you know, get people interested, of course, initiates such a procedures. Of course, not every equipment is just freely available to everybody. The users should have certain skills to use the equipment. Either they should go through some training, they should acquire certificates or whatever. You know, 
for every equipment. Of course, this needs to be clearly listed, uh, publicly announced what is required for the equipment to be used. But on the other hand, you know, if you are offering an equipment and you have a user that has the idea how this equipment could be used for his purposes but does not know how to use it personally, we can offer services. So we can provide, you know, some scanning or whatever, you know, so that the user just gets the final product without him necessarily personally using this equipment. Uh, with that, of course, the users also have to observe all the regulatory documents, you know, regulations, principles, whatever any entity has put forward. Now, entity proposes, you know, how to operate the equipment at the lowest level, and then every institution, like university, has then to um, declare the open access policy on a general level. So at our university, we approach this like that, that we first went from the top level, where we uh, constituted a open access policy on the top university level, and then ask the faculties and the entities to observe these general guidelines into their own uh, open access policies. You know, because of course, when you go to the faculty, there might be some special circumstances that they have to take into the account when you go to the entity level and when you uh, uh, define the, the regulations for a certain type of equipment, there could even be more specific specifications, you know. But all this is necessary to be done in ordered manner, so there must be guidelines and through these guidelines, of course, we can get transparent conditions for using such equipment. Open access can be in different forms. So this can be physical, remote, or virtual. Like physical, I already explained, you know, you sit, you know, with a microscope, do the scanning, you know, get the results. The remote can be that you use a supercomputer remotely. You are sitting at your home and another country and another place in the world, you know, but through the network, you are using the supercomputer. Or can be also virtual. Or some equipment can also be like that, that you can operate it remotely. You know, some tests, you know, are operated, motorized, you know. You just send the samples, you know, and you can operate them remotely. Probably, if you have been to some living labs, you have had a first-hand experience, you know, how to do some tests, some testing, you know, uh, remotely. And of course, virtual, which means that we are using the internet as a platform or mobile devices as a platform to use certain softwares, you know, certain uh, services, capabilities to operate in virtual world, you know. It's that we have a feeling, you know, it's everything happening in front of us, but basically it can happen anywhere in the world, doesn't matter when things are generated, computed, you know, with uh, very fast mobile speeds nowadays, this is very easy to do, and this is, of course, also our future. With the introduction of the artificial intelligence, we will see large changes in the way how we do our research. Even now, when, when we have internet, I'm still, let's say, old enough to remember how it was before internet, before 1990, you know. I had the privilege to send one of the first emails from Europe to United States because I was doing my PhD in UK in computer science and engineering, so advanced computational simulations. I had a friend that he, he was doing PhD at Los Angeles UCLA University. And we sent first emails in academic world, you know, throughout uh, the Atlantic, you know. It took four and a half hours because we had to program every single point. We have to ping the computers, you know, that have open gates to transfer the email message. Nowadays, this is just like that, you know. It's amazing, you know. And of course, this amazing world now creates a large opportunities, you know. But we have to also change our thinking, how we approach these issues. Unfortunately, as I see it, the technology has overpassed the humankind, you know, in understanding how to best utilize these uh, technologies. I am sad to say that I see 
much less use of this technology in professional world than I see in private world of people, you know. But there are huge opportunities, you know, if we share data, share information, you know, also in our professional world to become more competitive in our research, to share information, you know, to discover what is happening around the world and then to fit in, you know, to contribute our part. Now the forms of open access also have the procedural element. And the open access to research equipment can be excellence driven, market driven, or can be widely accessed. Now the most important difference is between first two. The wide access means no limitations. Anybody can use it for whatever time, you know, uh, freely accessible. But excellence driven access is a type of procedures how you can gain access to the equipment if you are working on a public funded project which means that then you have less protection of the data that is generated through this access. Okay, because it is public, it should be public. You know, European community is putting a lot of effort in the past 10 years, you know, first to create European research area, then to promote the open science, open access, which means that we should collaborate more and more in the future. We are still at the beginning of these procedures, but in a let's say, five, ten years, you know, this will become our modus operandi in general. Now, throughout this week, you have made different discussions. I was uh, private to be here um, two days before uh, listening to my guys, Nate and Emre, and there was a lot of talk about stealing research, information, data, you know, everything, you know. We are thinking so much about stealing, you know, that we forget about different opportunities. But we should then approach, you know, how to address this stealing, you know, how to, how to provide proof of authorship for somebody in this new world, you know. And this is something that people from law should concentrate on. And also how to, let's say, adapt as a society, academic society or general society to all these new happenings. But this is the task for the social sciences, that they should provide, you know, some guidance, research, you know. So plenty of opportunities to address this new uh, world that is happening around us. And if we stay behind, we will always lag behind. So we should, let's say, try to think outside of uh, our frame of thinking now, how we see this technology and perhaps better utilize its advantages for the future. Now, market-driven access is uh, the access to the research equipment, which is usually reserved for the private sector. So companies can pay to do some advanced research using some equipment, but of course companies work on the market. So they are competitive. They would like to hide their results. And we should oblige. So market-driven access provides the procedures how to protect the data, you know, that only the company that ordered some research has access to this data. So this data is not openly available, nobody can see it, but just the company that ordered it. Of course, this required some security measures, you know, some data protection, some uh, encryption of the data, if you would like to think in that way, you know, when you store the data to some servers. So, uh, and also um, uh, blockchain technology, when you communicate end to end with the user, if it, this data is really sensitive, you know, so it's much more demanding. But the companies, of course, are paying for this uh, uh, increased effort that we are putting into the protecting data for them. Wide access is very uh, general access, so no limitations, no special procedures. Everybody has a free access. And uh, in Europe, it is very seldomly put into the operation, you know, because most of the equipment uh, cannot be widely uh, accessed. But all this access, of course, uh, can be granted after an application. So it is not just that, that you will show up on the doors of the entity and say, oh, I would like to use this equipment. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately, so far, you know. 
So we have to make an application explaining what you are doing, declaring the type of the project that you are working on so that they, they can, the entity can differentiate between excellence or market-driven access. And then, of course, this access should be put, put into timing slot and then the access can be granted. You know, but this should be like a transparent, clear procedure where there is, of course, the tracking for all the time. Uh, of course, the entities uh, can use the equipment that they purchased by public funds uh, also just for themselves. If they can demonstrate that, you are using, that they are using this equipment 100%, so all the time. You know, some equipment like in chemical sciences, you know, specifically, you know, it's uh, running in long term analysis or whatever processes, you know, and it is very common. Like uh, supercomputer, you know, you cannot declare that you will use it 100 percent by yourself, you know, because it can run uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs simultaneously, you know, on millions of cores, you know. so. In modern supercomputer now, you can hardly put up a computing job, job to use the whole supercomputer. So this then differentiates again uh, from entity to entity. But this uh, access should be provided under clear, transparent, and fair conditions. So how do you access the equipment should be known in advance, should be written down. Not that somebody could just uh, make up, you know, oh, I cannot do it now because that and that, you know, this, of course, in the public research infrastructure is um, not really acceptable. You know. <coughs> but this access can also be granted in uh, different units. So if it is a sequential equipment, you know, that like microscope that you sit down, you can do just one job, you know, this can be in hours. If, again, it's a supercomputer, then you can declare it into number of core hours, numbers of uh, gigabytes or terabytes of the RAM that you are using, number of uh, gigabytes or terabytes of the storage that they are using, number of cycles if the equipment runs under certain cycles. So this uh, measure can be different, you know, easily to understand and sometimes very complicated, but should be declared in advance. And also it should be declared, you know, how much of this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, measure it's available for open access and how much we will use for our own research. Again, this should be transparent. Uh, throughout the procedure, of course, the uh, potential users can make a demand to use the equipment at a certain time, you know, number of cycles or whatever. This should be a kind of justifiable by describing just shortly in a couple of uh, sentences, you know, the type of research that they are doing so that the entity can then evaluate, you know, if that amount of the access is appropriate for the type of the research that is being done. Then, of course, uh, this access can be negotiated if necessary on or can be granted stand forward. Sometimes, you know, for, let's say, less complicated equipment, you know, this is not just such a big deal, but uh, when you have a kind of a complicated equipment, you know, that demands a special, I don't know, gases, special material, you know, that should be present, you know, in, in uh, necessary amounts, this is always then a kind of negotiation how to actually do this. Okay, now it works. Okay, of course, uh, I was telling you already at the beginning, you know, that uh, in general, if the public money is used to purchase the equipment, if public money is used to operate the equipment, you know, use of this equipment for all researchers on public projects should be free. But the situation is that almost uh, anywhere in the world, you know, the public money is not enough to provide the operation for all the equipment. Some yes, but some also no. 
and sometimes the equipment is also purchased in combination with donations from the companies because companies are usually interested you know to in some specialized research they of course have no interest to invest a lot of money in their own research centers because they need then qualified people uh, they need to run the equipment you know they have to purchase the equipment and for some specialized um, research this is simply not economically viable so usually they approach the universities and get into the negotiation and then usually they cover a part of the purchase cost and they cover also a part of the operations costs which means that with that they gain the right that this equipment is at a certain negotiated percentage used just for their research whenever that is necessary usually these are kind of long term contracts you know yearly or several years uh, especially if you are working in the fields of, uh, let's say, forensic science, that uh, some terrible car crash accidents, uh, train accident, plane accident happens, and the company would like, uh, you know, to discover very fast, you know, why did it happen. And they, they approach the universities with which they have contract or the university or the institutes, you know, to... Uh, of course, uh, get their immediate attention, immediate allocation of the equipment, you know, to get to the bottom of the cause for the accidents as soon as possible. You know, so this is another type like emergency situations. In between, of course, there are some long-term corporations that can also provide for certain combinations. Of course, if the equipment is uh, mixed, has a mixed funding, then if this equipment is used outside this uh, percentage for the for the company, of course, then the universities or institutes can claim or charge the fees to use the equipment, and they can also charge for the operational cost for using the equipment for a certain research. Now, again, it depends how large these costs are at how much public money was used for this equipment now in our country it is um, it is common for the past decade that when you compete for research equipment at some tenders from our research agency that you have to provide co-financing because without co-financing you cannot get the equipment you know the government would not give you 100% money for the equipment. These two projects was exemption. But this was the consequence of long-term negotiation. Okay. And of course, this funding, co-funding comes from various sources, either from the money that you have left over from other projects, or usually you go to companies and try to uh, interest them, you know, to invest this money into it. And then we, of course, come into the mixed ownership, which then dictates, you know, how much fees and costs you can claim. But in any case, this should be written down and publicly announced in advance so that anybody that has interest in using any equipment can calculate his own cost in advance. So there are no surprises. You know, sometimes in the past, you know, some entity leaders, you know, they just uh, defined the cost like that, you know. They looked at the company, oh, they are rich, you know, we will make, you know, top prices for them, you know. Of course, this is not right, you know, now, nowadays. Of course, the access fees for different types of uh, public research infrastructures must observe certain principles, you know. Uh, because if you operate public uh, equipment, then, of course, always you have to take care about the accountability, traceability, double funding prohibition, and compliance with all, uh, uh, all um, laws and, and regulations in a country and in the European Union. Now, here we have a double funding prohibition. Now, this means that uh, especially if the European money like it was used for the supercomputer and for the uh, equipment of University of Maribor is used to obtain research equipment, then there is a general European limitation that only up to 20% of the research equipment capabilities can be used for commercial research. 
no less than 80% should be used for public research. If, of course, we would uh, uh, overcome this 20% limitation, then we fall on the double funding uh, um, uh, um, situation, which means that we are not anymore uh, granted 100% funding for purchasing the equipment. And uh, this prohibition uh, lasts for the whole amortization period of the equipment. Usually this amortization is like uh, two to three years for computers and five years for general equipment. You know, Throughout that time, we must observe how we use this equipment for private research and for the public research. Of course, the equipment is not just to support the, the research, but uh, at least at the universities, it should also be used for education. Not education as general for the students, you know, because some of this equipment is so complicated that you need PhD qualified persons to operate it. But to educate also the researchers from other disciplines or for the same disciplines that probably such do not have such equipment, but they are interested in making best use out of it. Also to provide training for other users. Some of the equipment that we have purchased at our university was basically the first of that kind in Europe, like a prototype equipment, you know, which was built by design of our researchers. You know, so now with this equipment, we are providing training from other researchers, you know, also for the uh, let's say future customers of the company that provided this uh, machine to us, you know, so they come here to observe, you know, how this prototype machine is actually working, you know, because it is not, it has not been available before. So also the system of open access to public research infrastructure should promote cooperation should promote education and training and of course sharing the necessary knowledge that is gained by using the top tier equipment. Of course there are certain limits. There always were and there always will be, you know, how this equipment can be used. Some of this equipment is can be so sensitive you know, because it is particular, especially for certain sectors like military sector, you know, that they present like strategic advantage of a certain country if they purchase such an equipment, you know, because certain types of tests can be done. In recent times, the strategic equipment of the country are supercomputers. You know, it is no wonder that in the world we have all the time a competition between China, United States, and Japan. Europe is lagging behind. Europe has only in 2016 started the Euro HPC joint undertaking and thinking seriously on how to invest big money into the supercomputers, which is going now. And we are planning to build exascale supercomputer. That means one to the power of 18 computing operations per second in 2025. China probably runs already two. United States probably two in hiding for NSA, none in the public. You know. So it's really a competition going on, you know, a lot of money in invested in this computing power. Uh, and we are all afraid about the China because China has now gone along the way of making their own CPUs you know, their own uh, electronic equipment in, and became almost completely independent from the United States. And this is a worrying uh, situation, but not because of the China, but because of the United States, because they do not take easily, you know, the fact that probably they will not be technological superpower anymore in the next 10 years. But this is the fact that we are now living in and we should, of course, try to find ways how to operate. So there will always be equipment that is very sensitive, you know, that is like, like geheim hidden, you know, for some other reason, you know. Also, there might be some privacy and confidelity, uh, confidel confi <coughs> okay, I, I don't know how to say this word probably. <laughs> so I will skip it, you can read it. <laughs> 
because sometimes you have research related to the personal data, to the people, especially in the medicine, you know, where we should an anonymize the data, you know, if you work for the companies, you know, you should take ob observe uh, the competition and stuff like this. Also, uh, business sensitivities. And then, of course, we also have the intellectual property rights. You know, this is something that we really should work on in the future. We should already have solved this already, you know. But I'm afraid that our friends from the law you are doing too little research into this, you know, to, um, let's say, find innovative ways how to protect intellectual property in the modern world, which happens all the time. You know, you are authors, you know, some ideas that you share on social media, you know, those are your ideas. We should find the ways how you can retain your intellectual rights for something, you know. In the past, it was very common that uh, China, I will go back to China because I collaborated with China for more than 20 years and I could observe all this process, you know. I was teaching at uh, some universities, there still, still am, and, but I'm now very careful how I teach, you know, because uh, like I remember 10 years ago, I, you know, started teaching at one university full of ideas. I was sharing these ideas just freely, you know, through my lectures, you know, three three months later that I come back, they already have like three to four PhD students, you know, working with this idea, you know, showing me the data, you know. I cannot compete with that. Nowadays I can hardly get PhD students, you know, from my country because they are not hungry anymore. You know, I get PhD students from other countries that are still hungry and willing to come and do research here. But in China, they're all hungry still, you know. And they do a lot of work, you know. Uh, they do a lot of high quality work, which then now shows. And uh, since China is investing a lot of money into science, something that we cannot compete with, you know, and having that amount of young intellect, you know, that is willing to put hard work, hard hours into research is really something amazing, you know. Now, in past five years, you know, I'm trying to uh, dial down my ideas, you know, and just uh, complain, oh, this is not possible, <laughs> do not do it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's a battle already lost, you know. So I guess we should uh, accept this not to compete because uh, we cannot compete, but just to, let's say, retain our special advantages that we have in Europe. Uh, because especially in engineering, I'm seeing, you know, that there is a potential that we will just be maintenance guys for the technologies coming from other countries. You know, in Europe, if we do not uh, put more money into science and research, get more equipment, you know, made it free, freely accessible and collaborate. Not to be afraid of get stolen your data, but to collaborate freely. But for that, again, we have to have certain procedures that are, of course, in operations. And of course, we should always expect the ethical aspects, you know, in our work, which I am pretty sure that we all do, especially in the public sector, this should be more and more emphasized because like in any community you always have some rotten apples you know that are breaking the rules and we if we accept this you know there is no way back you know to orderly operations we have to identify this we have to judge this you know we have to be open about this so, ethical conduct, uh, we have implemented the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity a long time ago. Our university has a label uh, for research excellence in uh, human resources for many years now. Uh, so, we observe this uh, conduct for, for already, so it became our, let's say, second thought and uh, this of course um, uh, is connected with the honesty and communication reliability in the conduct of research impartiality and independence openness and accessibility duty of care fairness in citing references in merit accountability to future scientists and researchers so all nice words all something you know that we already know that it is good and it should be that way but it is important that we also implement this 
through our actions, through our procedures, that we observe all these like general guidelines, you know, because after, uh, behind each of these, there is a kind of philosophy, a kind of way how you approach to implement this in your community. Of course, uh, there is always a, 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 a need to check the quality of your procedures. So open access to research infrastructure necessitates a lot of procedures to be set up, to be monitored, to be corrected, and to be improved. So here we have implemented the RACER, so relevant, accepted, credible, easy, and robust principles, which means that we do not want to over bureaucratize things, you know, another word that I have difficulty with pronouncing, sorry about that, you know. So just what is necessary, but this should be robust. So this is not something that happens just in the mind of one person, but this is something that happens in the community. So you make the introductory period, which is always necessary. When we implement certain principles, you know, you put forward these principles, but they should be negotiated beforehand, and there should always be a room for the intermediate period to full implementation, when people can observe, can check, you know, can propose, you know, how to make something more simple or more complicated. It's depending. But here it is necessary that these principles should be observed in a proper manner and also predicted in that way. So, of course, there is always a matrix behind. Like you have discussed already this week, you know, that in publications we have metrics, we have journal citation reports, we have citations, you know, that are now completely misused by the academia. You know, they are far away from the general intention like it was in the beginning, you know, set up by the library services, you know, just to rank something. Now we are just pressing the button. We get a number for a certain researchers that they calculated by a certain metrics, and we say, oh, he is good, he is no good. That's not fair. That is really not fair. Because we should look at the whole portfolio of the researcher. You know, because now we see a large deviations in that, and also one of the, let's say, accompanying measures of properly implementing open science in Europe is also the change how we evaluate the science and the research work of people, groups, institutions. We always forget to look at the big picture, and the big picture is very important, you know, the environment that every researcher is working on you know, the capabilities that he has at his, he or she has at his or her disposal, you know, the proper funding, you know, everything is very important, which should be taken into account, you know, because, you know, at European projects, you know, people from the Western uh, Europe, from the Central Europe and from the Eastern Europe, you know, they have very different environments and they were competing, you know, for the same money, by by the same rules, not fair. No. And then a lot of money was invested into already developed countries, you know. So also our country, you know, had to rise up, you know, with uh, being uh, taking up the challenge, you know, trying to adapt, you know. But still, you know, if you have the circumstances, you know, that are not in your favor, it's very difficult to compete. And we all would like to make the better use of our potential and to even out of the field that we are working on. So also in the uh, research infrastructures, we have different metrics, you know, that we, of course, can observe either the time that equipment has been used, you know, the projects that were run on the equipment, you know, if we are meeting some strategic indicators, because this is always necessary when you make the investment project, you have to promise to the government that in the next 10 years we will meet this, this and these strategic objectives. And of course, financial metrics, because we would all like at the end to see that we are operating, you know, basically in public institutions at uh, zero profit, you know, but if there is any profit, it is already, already usually used for reinvest the money into the new equipment, new services, and stuff like that. 
Data management, I will not uh, spend a lot of time here because you have uh, heard about data management, you know, in several, uh, several presentations uh, this week already. Uh, of course, data management is also very important when you are building up a system for open access to public infrastructure. So in our case, because we already also have a university supercomputer that was acquired through the HPC River Investment Project, uh, not so powerful like the one that you will see uh, this afternoon, but still a very powerful one. But what is very important is that this supercomputer was designed with a large data field. At least uh, three petabytes of data field, which is more than enough to store all the uh, university data that is being generated. And we are planning to purchase soon the next 10 petabytes of the storage, you know, to plan for the next five years because more and more digital data is generated, you know, and this data should be properly stored. In the framework of the HPC River uh, project, we have already set up a, a, a service to store the data at the university under the FAIR principle. So we have identified uh, among all our entities, you know, what type of data they are generating you know, in what format, what programs they are using, at what, um, at, at what amount they are using it, you know, just to identify what are the needs of the whole university. The same project is now running on the Slovenian level because on this only, already on the Slovenian level, they will build two large data centers, one in Maribor and one in Ljubljana, so they will be redundant because Ljubljana is in the earthquake region, Maribor is it's not. So it is safer data here in Maribor, just joking. <laughs> I do not wish earthquake to happen, of course, but we should take this into the account we're planning for the, for the future. Uh, and of course, also, when you build a storage, then you also have to provide the services that researchers can store their data so that they have proper instructions how to generate the metadata, which are the most important because they provide information, you know, what data is stored, in what format, how can be reused, you know, is it in, in, uh, interoperable or it is not, you know, all that, you know, just for a couple of the keywords. So it is very important. <coughs> and of course, transparency. Uh, transparency is very important so that people do not look for information, you know, by themselves, but there should always be a single information point or, or single uh, entry point uh, which is publicly available that everybody can access, either that be a service, either that be a web platform or whatever, but a single point of entry you know, that anybody that is interested in using our equipment can access. So we have a directorate, we have a special service, the Department of Research and Art Artistic Arts, you know, that serves as a single point of entry to access any public research infrastructure in, in, uh, at, at our uh, university. And we have also set up a publicly available online platform for full implementation of the open access. We call it the BRIUM, that is the base of the research infrastructure of University of Maribor, which contains all the data about all research equipment that we have in operation at the university, that contains also all the uh, access regulations, all the data, all the contact persons, so it is available. And this uh, BRIUM is not just a platform, you know, to share the data, but it is a platform that is working on three layers. So one top layer is public, so public information that anybody can see from anywhere in the world. Then you have the layer of the registered users. So anybody that would like to use any equipment should register. So, so should share with us some data about him or herself. Where is he, she working, you know, what type of research is doing, in what equipment it is interested. But once you register, then you have access to even more data about the research equipment, some specialized, and you have a possibility 
also to make an online reservation to use the equipment. You have a possibility to upload your certificates that you are qualified to use the, this equipment. So all this negotiation process can be done through this platform. And then we have the third layer, which is administrative layer. At every faculty, we have the coordinator for the research equipment that operates on that level. So he or she handles all these requests, forwards these requests to the uh, 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 entity leaders, you know, uh, takes care about the process going on that this uh, access can be completed. And also this administrative layer is quite comprehensive because it provides, it's all like um, digital document data and it uh, provides instant reporting, you know, because every year we have to report to the ministry, you know, how we have used this equipment. And if this is done on the, on the, let's say, administrative level as a part of this platform, you know, this can be done at any time, you know, just with the press of the couple of the buttons. And uh, this uh, uh, Brium also, I will just show you a little bit. This is the entry point, you know, because you can look for the equipment by searching on a map. So it's a map for every equipment, you know, geographically where it is placed, and you can also use it directly from the entry point by the research uh, um, uh, keywords. And then, of course, you can list this equipment, you know, by certain keywords or whatever. You know, this is like general data in the describing what some equipment is you know, so that you can find, okay, this equipment is interesting. If then you are interested, you can look for the more information, the location of the data, you know, and then you can also have the contact points, you know, how to make a personal contact if you like, or you can make a contact also through this infrastructure. Unfortunately, I cannot show you yet the operation because it is still in the introductory phase. So it is still in testing phase. Hopefully, you know, because it's a big system, you know, there are a lot of things that we have to improve. Hopefully, this system will be in full operation by the end of this year, you know, or at least by the end of the investment project. This is what we have promised to do, but it is a big system, you know, that uh, we first try to purchase some system, you know, because there are some similar systems in Europe, especially we were very uh, 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 impressed by the Romanian system, uh, which they have built up and we have negotiated at the beginning, but then we discovered that they cannot adapt their system to our needs because they are uh, hierarchical order. It's totally different how we, let's say, uh, make hierarchy at our uh, academic sector here in Slovenia. So we built a completely new system, which hopefully will also become a national system when this is uh, fully tested and put into the proper operation. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. I hope I have shared some of the ideas how we are approaching the open access to the research infrastructure with you. I hope there were some good uh, informations for you, you know, but when thinking about open access, you know, we should never forget that also the access to the research infrastructure needs to be properly mandated, you know, to be open, transparent, that you know in the advanced where is something, you know, how you can use it, how you can access it, and how much it costs. Thank you so much.